Well, I'm Eric Abraham, and I'd like to welcome you here this evening to the first Oxford uh, session of the inaugural Humanitas Visiting Professorship in Drama. And uh, we are enormously privileged tonight to have not only our visiting professor of drama, Athol Thugard, legendary man of magnitude, to use his own words, I'm sorry, <laughs> but two um, major playwrights, British playwrights, Rebecca Lankiewicz and Jess Butterworth. Um, uh, Rebecca's uh, latest play um, was at the National Theatre. She became the first woman to have an original play on the main stage at the National Theatre. Jez, at the age of 26, uh, had his first play, Mojo, performed at the Royal Court, and then it went on to a very successful West End run. Um, we first encountered each other when I produced the film that he directed of Mojo. Um, and uh, uh, Rebecca's latest play was called Naked, Her Naked Skin. It, was, it had its locus in the suffragette movement. It was about equality, wonderful play. Jez's latest play, Jerusalem, um, a, a rural, darkly comedic, rural dystopia. Um, a wonderful, extraordinary play, too. Um, and, of course, The Train Driver, which is why we're here tonight. Athel, um, a, a, a play that's currently on at the Hampstead Theatre. This is a plug. Don't miss it. Um, it's a powerful play about our common humanity, enlightenment, <coughs> set in contemporary South Africa. Um, and for this session, which is loosely titled Playwriting the Process, Athel was very keen that we had no preparation. So anything yes. can happen, um, and hopefully it will. It will be, at his insistence, a three-way and a four-way, because there will be an opportunity for questions afterwards. Um, and we use this, uh, as the case study, for want of a better word, the train driver, and I'm going to hand over to Athel for the journey that it took um, when it first started 10 years ago yes. um, till today. So, Athel. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, there's something I wanted to read, which I thought might provide... You know, the train driver. Do you want me to talk about the train driver? I think you should do whatever you feel you want to do, well, Ethel. So I please just read. felt that it's something that, you know, could provoke an interesting discussion between the three of us. Wow. And it, it, what it amounts to, it, don't worry, it's not all these pages. I just made copies in, <laughs> in case you wanted, <laughs> <laughs> wanted, wanted to read it. It's an entry from my published notebooks. And I made this entry... In 1963, um, I had written my two apprenticeship plays, as I call them, a plays which don't have much of a life outside of South Africa, but which are certainly still alive inside the country, two plays which uh, particularly young black actors use a lot in their training and in preparation for a professional life in theatre. But then came what I regard as my watershed play, you know, I don't know what it is like for Rebecca or for Jez, but I, I think there comes a moment when you recognize for the first time, instead of being a imitator, because my two apprenticeship plays were basically imitations of the plays that I had admired, plays by the, 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 the American playwrights, um, O'Neill, Tennessee Williams and Miller. They had a great influence on me. And, but when I came to write The Blood Knot, I, knew, I recognized my own voice. I knew that I had told a story, written something that only I could have done. And I, I think that's an important moment in a writer's life. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Agree? Absolutely. That you tell a story that only you know only you can tell. And... Um, that is a play I had written and which be was a huge success in South Africa, bewilderingly so, because it, up until that point, the notion that the, a South African story was worthy of the stage was uh, a laughable matter. I mean, it was uh, 
by and large, theatre in the country at that point in time was just an anemic imitation of what was happening in the West End with an occasional nod to the classics. <coughs> and suddenly there was a piece of raw South Africa on the stage and uh, people wanted it and enjoyed it. Uh, when, I, when we took it to London, Ken Tynan was in his supremacy and he tore it to pieces. <laughs> and I um, <coughs> licked my wounds and went back to South Africa, but I was fortunate in that the director of that play decided it deserved a better ch another chance and he took it to America. And in America, the parallels for the first time between the South African experience and the American experience, uh, they, they limited parallels, they don't go all the way, but the whole issue of race is as, well, for that matter, it is the same now in this country, isn't it? But at that point in time, 1963, it was still a terrible issue and remains to this day a terrible issue in American politics. And uh, that's why President Obama will not get a second term in Parliament, I mean in the White House. So it was a success in America and I went back to South Africa and uh, I had settled down to write my next play. And this was made, I think it must have been a month or two months after I had returned from my America where I'd seen the production of my play. And it's an entry from my notebook. Sheila, that's my wife, asked me last night, why do you write plays? I mean, do you prefer to write plays rather than novels or poetry? She was asking that question because I had also written a novel called Tsotsi, um, and I always try to write poetry, which I'm, but I'm not good at either of those two prose. Looking back, it is easy to find the accidents that seem to have led me to playwriting rather than prose or poetry. And yet the conviction and assurance with which I turn to this medium time and time again, the freedom with which I think and feel in it, makes me want to believe that there is more to it than accident. After all, each literary medium can do something the others can't. And what plays can do, I no doubt want to do. Though, of course, this could be an acquired ability. Possibly the whole issue is as circular as any consideration of cause and effect, which came first, the hen or the egg. Nevertheless, there is present, regardless of its origin, there is a reality present, regardless of its origin, and I feel I can say something about what it is, even if I can't say how it came about. In the theatre, of course, my fascination lies with the living moment, the actual, the real, the immediate, there before our eyes, even if it shares in the transient fate of all living moments. I suppose the theatre uses more of the actual substance of life than possibly any other art. What comes anywhere near theatre in this respect, except a, possibly a painter using old bus tickets or the sculptor using junk iron and driftwood? The theatre uses flesh and blood, sweat, the human voice, real pain, real time. Which brings me to another fact about playwriting, as strongly, if not stronger, than the audience's awareness of the actors and the living moment, there is the actor's awareness within that moment. Let me put it this way, there are two perspectives to a theatrical experience, from without, that of the audience, and from within, that of the actor. This of course applies to music as well. On the surface, plays less so with mu than, than with music, exist or rather are justified by the first perspective, you, the audience. It is not to amuse, if it's not to amuse them, it's to enlighten them or instruct or increase their awareness. One day someone must point out that as great a reality, in fact a full half of the whole reality, is that of the actor. It requires both. What happens to the audience is matched 
is equaled by what happens to the actor. Those strange beings, men and women, are as deeply affected as those watching. My wholeness as a playwright is that I contain within myself both experiences. I watch and am watched. I examine the experience and I experience the motion of a pendulum. Or, if that is too balanced and sane a movement, let me rather speak of an agitation between two poles of awareness. Why do you write plays? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I mean, this is... That you was the in out, 1963? That, yeah, that was the outpourings of a, you know, I was... How 30, old were you? Yeah, I was 46 years ago, for God's sake, wow. so be merciful. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. It's really... Um, that, that's what I'm doing. It's, you know, I... You begin there by saying why you choose playwriting over other forms, and yeah. the reason why I choose it is exactly the same, because plays really happen. That's right. They're dangerous. I mean, the moment in the theatre, something I was talking, I was saying to an audience last night in our talk back, is that audiences aren't often aware of how incredibly active their presence is in terms of the event. Mm on stage. I mean, both Rebecca and Jez and myself, all three of us have had our little stints of being out there on the stage. And I'm sure they would agree with me in, 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 in stressing the importance of how real a personality, this sort of random group of individuals, they come from all different parts of the, of, of, of the society in which the, the, the play is taking place. And, Somehow, miraculously, within three or four minutes of the house lights going down and stage lights coming up, you acquire a personality. Yeah. I mean, as I'm sitting here now, I'm very conscious. Are you of a personality out there? <coughs> very much <Yes>. so. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, every time I write a play or, or have a play on, it's a bit like a bad love affair. I just think that's the last time. You know, that is the last oh, time. Absolutely, yeah. And then, you know, uh, you go, oh, no, I can do it once more. You know, my heart can bear it once more. You know, and you sort of go out and you do it. And I mean, today I was, I, I went into a, a tech because I've got um, a play on. And the actors, you know, they're on tomorrow. And they were so enthusiastic. A wonderful actress, B.T. Edney, she was really saying but I don't know why I'm saying it, you know? And this is like the day before tomorrow, you know? And, and the director, wonderful, was saying, well, we've talked about this, <laughs> you know? But it's just like a reinvention, you know? And I get incredibly moved by the collaboration of it. And yet each time I fear the collaboration and each time I think I must start writing prose because it's like pure and nobody's going to miscast it yeah, or do this to yeah, it or do that yeah. to it. But I think if I did, I'd so miss that absolute... I get moved. You know, somebody's doing the props today and they're saying we need an orange flower. Yellow is wrong. You know, it needs to be orange. And it's the detail and all these different people, craftsmen, technicians, and then the actors who lay themselves out there. And, and each time I forget that that's why I'm doing it, you know, and, and then you get to rehearsal and you get to the performance and the nerves involved. And it's beautiful. Well, I think what you've touched on, of course, is something that is not always appreciated, is how supreme theatre is as a collaborative art. Mm. I mean, there's no one person, no one source, not even the playwright, who can actually take full credit for the event on stage that you have paid to see you and then you receive and you go home. No one person, I mean, it's... Firstly, there's a set, there's lighting, they're the actors, they're technicians backstage, all of them, all of us coming together and trying to give you that one experience. I, I'm very moved by that aspect of the art. Yeah, I think the root of it is in that presence. And I think it's why theatre as an art form is capable of being the very best art form and also the very worst art form. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you're there sitting through it. You can sit through a bad film and just lose a lot less skin than you mm. do sitting through a bad play. I mean, just to perhaps prove the point of presence, you can go to a, to a 
cinema in, in an afternoon and be the only person in the cinema. And it's not a problem. In fact, sometimes it's quite nice. But if you went to that, see a matinee and you were the only person in the audience, you're going to have a very different thing asked of you. You're going to be embarrassed, perhaps, or you're going to feel like you want to yeah. get out of there. Well, you're solely you're responsible room. for the event, aren't you? I mean. And that just speaks to the idea that when you show up to see a play, you're being asked more. That's absolutely. Absolutely. It's an incredibly active and dangerous experience because it happens m second by second. And your presence, you know, is, is making it, making it happen. Uh, there's an element of danger in live theatre that's, that's, without us realising it, electrifying. I know uh, that's, that's how I feel about it. But I must also say, apropos of what I said there about the actors from within and the audience being with, without, uh, it was a conversation with Peter Brook one night and Peter said to me, uh, Ethel, he said, what is it? He had a, he'd had a bad day in the rehearsal room. He said, can you explain something to me? I said, anything, Peter. <laughs> and he said, why is it that actors will get a chance to play Lear, Hamlet, Coriolanus, great roles, Pierre Gint, Hedda Gabler, but they remain very unaffected. They still remain very stupid and obstinate in the rehearsal <laughs> room. They learn nothing. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? I don't know. I, don't I, know. I mean, I've only acted in my own play, so I can't talk about having learnt anything, but I mean... What do you think? I think with each play, in a way, everyone starts again. You know, I mean, I don't know any director who's not nervous about starting a new play. You've got, I think you've hit the nail and on I the don't head. know any writer who doesn't start. I mean, every time I start <coughs> new, I don't feel like I've got any treasure in the backlog. I just feel like I'm starting again, yeah, you know, know. and yeah. I'm scratching in the dust. We, you know? we, we exchanged comments about that and notes before we came out here to you tonight. And I agree with uh, Rebecca that when I sit down, and I will be going back to my table where I write in, on Sunday, nothing that lies behind me is going to help me mm. address blank paper. Again, I'm going to pick up my fountain pen and think, how the hell do you start? You know? And fortunately, most plays start with a stage direction. So at least I can make the opening bracket, you know. They're very comforting stage directions. Oh, God, are they wonderful. I, I make them, I drag them out, believe me. <laughs> I also think it's interesting that, you know, you write a play and everyone thinks, you know, the word is the root. And, and it is, you know, it starts with the word. But it's also a kind of blueprint. You know, it, it, it's got... I, I often ask myself, why do I put myself through this hell of distance, of this, of misinterpretation, of this and that? And, you know, you do enter it willingly. You say, OK, here is... I mean, they're, they're more clear about it in film, aren't they? They say, you know, you haven't made a film, you've written a script, you know? And, and yeah. the script then becomes something else. Whereas in plays, people sometimes say, well, this is the play, this is, you know, treasure. But it does become something else, you know? And I mean, I was reading about Strindberg recently and it was saying how he'd written Miss Julie in two weeks. I mean, that's two weeks' worth of work that has led to, you know, yeah. a century of, you know, mm. academic whatever and different interpretations. It's, you sort of give something and then it sails out, doesn't it? It's interesting you describe it as treasure because I've always seen it as a treasure map. Mm -hmm. uh, that, it's, that it's pointed, it's saying over here is something that, by which we may, um, as a group, uh, enjoy ourselves and possibly transcend. And so, I mean, I've, ne I've always got into a rehearsal room um, without that kind I remember Howard would always say, you know, you've got to, if I put three dots, it's, it's going to be a pause of a certain length. Uh, if I put four, it's going to be different. Um, I never felt like that. I've always felt um, that, you, it's usually because I finished them in the first week of rehearsal, but um, th that there is a kind of a, a wet clay feeling at the start of a, a rehearsal period that I love. Mm. That if you go into a rehearsal with your ears open, so that's really where you make the play. Well, I, I, I agree. I, mean, I was going to ask uh, both of you what, how much 
um, the actual rehearsal process has contributed to the final product in terms of text. I've had experiences where, well, for the extreme example is, for example, the collaborative work I did with John Carney and Winston and Chawner, which produced two plays, which had a very healthy life. One was called Sizwe Bonzi is Dead, and the other one was called The Island. Totally collaborative work. You know, mm -hmm. the three of us getting together, you know, and after a process, four, five, six weeks later, there was a play. Uh, then just more, in a more orthodox sense, I've taken a manuscript into a rehearsal room, um, and I've actually found that actors and their comments and their reactions to moments have helped me see possibilities that weren't there in my, I didn't know were there originally, and have it actually led to some additional text being written, you know, not just on the spur of the moment. I usually mull it over at home and then come back the next day with a with the new text and we work it in and, and um, there were little bits and in, in, t in terms of the train driver, little moments that the two actors enriched for me and helped me develop and fill out. And then I've, there have been plays that I've taken into the rehearsal room and have come out the other end on the stage without a, even a, so much as a full stop or a comma having been altered. Mm. What were your experiences in terms of rehearsal and the actors and what they say and do? or the director. You see, I have always directed the first productions of my play. So, and as far as I'm concerned, what comes out of that experience then becomes a definitive text. And, um, but anyway, that, I just... I've never directed my work, and I always have a pre-conversation with the director, and, and script changes will happen there. Any, so, any desire to direct? Yes, but if I was going to direct, I'd definitely start with something that was not my work. You know, just something away from me, so that I felt like I could sort of play in the playground without the pressure of me and my work. Well, I was forced to do my own directing and acting because when I first started out writing my plays in South Africa, mm. <laughs> nobody wanted to do them, mm. you know, so... <laughs> That was very really simple for me. And uh, what about you, Jim? <laughs> well, my experience has been predominantly with the Royal Court Theatre in London, and uh, you know, it's a theatre that puts on uh, new plays. And when I started there, Ian Rickson was the associate director, then became the, the artistic director, and still directs my plays. And so I found someone, I was lucky, I found someone early on with whom uh, I could work in a very, very open, fluent and fluid way. And so I've been spared the uh, uh, ordeal of having to, to get up and, and um, cheerlead the thing through for six, seven weeks into production, which I think I would find uh, exhausting. Mm. The films that I've made, the couple of films that I've made, I found thrilling, but mostly exhausting. I mean, it, it's just, it's a knackering process. And, and I think I'm much more suited to the process of, of, of uh, coming up with the treasure map and then joining in as fully as you're allowed uh, with someone like Ian or someone like the Royal Court where you're in the rehearsal room all the time. It's a lot more, it's a lot easier to sit at the back of a rehearsal room mm. watching than it is to direct a play. And you can, you can see it, you're allowed a perspective that I've found, that's how I can make the play. If I was there having to deal with um, all of the problems of the actors and the day to day, I'm not sure I'd have a weather eye to where the play was going. So that's why I'd do it. Mm. Well. I think I quite like, too, the fact that someone else has faith in the piece, you know, <laughs> because I think my faith would flounder, do you know, and I don't, I don't think I'd have the confidence to go, this is, you know, this is what we're doing and this is where we're going, you know, it's kind of like someone says to me, oh, this scene is about loss, isn't it, and I nod and say, yeah, you know, and, and, and it suddenly sounds, you know, I never thought it was about loss, but it's quite nice to have a sort of, you know, profound yeah. stamp marked. One thing I think it's really important to do though is in, in the early stages of rehearsal is to really listen to which actors are complaining. Really? <laughs> and if you think that they're the right person for the job and they're not wrong, then it means you are. Mm. That, that there is something in what they're being called upon to do that isn't chiming with them. And I'll give you an example. There was an actor, we had 15 or 16 actors in Jerusalem at the Royal Court uh, year before last. And uh, 
Tom Brook, uh, who, who played Lee in, in the play, came to me and he said, um, I read an earlier draft of this and it was just, just better. We've just read what you've just done. I've just, um, I'm not sure it's for me at all. And uh, you've got a choice to make at that point, which is you can say, well, go home then, or you can ask him why. And, and it was really interesting. He just felt that, that he didn't have uh, a journey through the piece that, that, that he felt that he could really get his teeth into. And he was absolutely right. And also insistent that he should leave. And I wrote, I re went home and rewrote the character as someone that wanted to leave. <laughs> uh, and wrote it as a character that was that, was that day going to be emigrating to Australia. And was it a good idea? <laughs> and it all came out of a conversation with an actor who wanted to leave. And so when it was rewritten, he knew exactly how to do it. <laughs> he knew how that felt. <laughs> and he did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, oh, I think actors are incredible. I think their instincts are incredibly valuable. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's... Well, you know, no, I was just thinking, I mean, I have had the misfortune to work with actors who thought the play was about them, yeah. selves. Um, you know... And what I always try to suss out is whether an actor is actually prepared to subordinate himself to something bigger than his own ego mm -hmm. and vanity and, um, and serve something bigger, you know, which is uh, that story as such. Because I don't know what your sense of yourself as a writer in theatre is, or yours, Rebecca, but I think of myself as a storyteller. That's as, it's as simple as that. I tell stories, uh, and um, for example, in the train driver, which, which I suppose the period here in London, I would rank as one of the happiest. And I must thank you for that, Eric, as one of the happiest I've had in my time in theatre, mm. and for the simple reason that, firstly, I was working with two actors, who I had worked with many times in the past, Owen Sajaki, who plays one role, and Sean Taylor, who plays another role. Now, the interesting thing was that we, before London, we did the play in Cape Town, in a beautiful theatre that Eric has uh, created uh, there. And um, <coughs> I was ill, and Sean Taylor was not well. And although we finally did have a product on the stage, I know that it was just, it, was, it wasn't even a warm-up for what we delivered here in London. And, you know, that is a profound debt of gratitude I've got to you, Eric, to, to have finally put onto the stage. And I, I've had the remarkable experience of being able to sit and watch my own play night after night. Now, Nothing has been harder for me in the past than to keep watching my own work. Mm. But somehow the truth with which those two actors, they, and it's, it's, it's quite mysterious, the truth which they somehow have managed to put their hands on and, and make theirs in terms of the role is, um, is something I still marvel at. I marvel at. And I, I don't think I can take any, resp uh, any credit for it. I just feel that they somehow did it, yeah. I think you have to take some credit for it. <laughs> well, you know. I think that's an interesting question. But just to go back to, to um, the idea of, of and, you know, the problems with actors, my experience has been, has been almost uniformly wonderful. Um, I think that actors become egotistical uh, and vainglorious at exactly the same moment that they become afraid. And it's, it's when I become, it's my ego gets in the way as soon as I'm scared and fearful. And I think that the, the job, when you're in a rehearsal room, is to try and uh, create as little fear and as much excitement and danger as possible, but as little fear. So that they're not feeling that they can shut off at some point and have to come up with some uh, other reason to be in the room other than that they're good at acting. Mm. 
Hmm. Yeah, fear is the root it's of where most it comes bad from, behavior, I'd say. I've, yeah. I've had good experiences with actors, bad experiences with directors. But uh, hmm. that's the end of the game, is. you see, the this, this, so, this situation in South Africa is there's no comparison between well, what I think of as a luxury that in terms of writing and getting produced in, in England where you've got a uh, I, 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 dislu disillusion me if I'm wrong, this incredible pool of, of gifted and talented actors. I mm. mean, it's astonishing, you know, what, what, when I think of the riches at your disposal. Yeah. I you mean, know, it's, it's extraordinary. In South Africa, the, the theatre community is much smaller. And as a result of that, and this actually has turned out to be a, a saving grace for me. I have had consistent experiences with a few, with just a handful of actors. John Carney, for example, came into my life when I tried to start, or did start, a drama group in Port Elizabeth, a black drama group. And from that moment on, you know, it led finally to Siswe Bonzi is Dead and The Island, which were huge successes. But then he went on to play in M Master Harold and the Boys. He went on to act in <coughs> another play of mine called uh, My Children, My Africa. And just, and then there's an actress dead now called Yvonne Bryceland, with whom I worked for a period of 22, 23 years. Mm. You know, and to have a relationship like that with an interpretive artist. Mm. And, well, you know, I always hesitate to use the word interpretive because I think there is a creative potential in the actor that is often ignored. And, that, you know, that, that, that can help you understand your own text. I always say to the actors at a certain point in rehearsal, and it's not a, a gimmick because it's the truth, I say, they ask me a question, I say, you know more about him now than I do. Mm. You know, they take yeah. possession of a role and it's their flesh and blood, their voice, their pain, as that little scribble mentioned, that actually is up there on the stage. You know, the author of Genesis, I think, loved theatre. The word was made flesh. Mm. <laughs> And I think you can sort of feel it when that happens. You know, in a rehearsal room initially, yeah. everyone wants you so much. You know, and there's these yeah. kind of waves of tell us, tell us, tell us. And then at and some they, point, there's a settling that's and they're like, exactly right. Don't, don't come in here. Exactly you know, I've got right. my equipment. Don't. You know, you might have written it, but don't. And I know not to, you know, because yes, that's it. They've, they've, Same for you, you know. just? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I always write with an audience in mind, but I really write for actors. Mm. The, the work's often inspired by particular actors, but an actor is going to spend uh, weeks with your play. You know, an audience is going to show up for a couple of hours. It's just a different level of commitment. And if you're going to, uh, if your work's going to be put on, you know, hopefully, you know, in 10 years' time, rather than just once, you want other people, other actors, to be inspired by that and for it to speak to them before it's ever going to talk to an audience. So I've always got them in mind. Mm. This is a unique group because I think with one exception, Rebecca, you are original storytellers. I, the enemy of the people was what loosely ba was based on the Ibsen, but mm. it's original storytelling. So it's, you don't have the shadow of another storyteller. Or perhaps I'm wrong, Ethel, have you, you, you've always told your own story. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And jazz. Yeah. In the theatre. Yeah, in the theatre, mm. certainly, yeah. Yes. And when you two write... How do you find your stories? <laughs> um, not often enough. <laughs> <laughs> they tend to show up and knock on the door. But how? Um, if I knew the answer to that, uh, I would be going there well, and trying a lot harder to find them. They, they, they just, there is something between a nearly idea and a, and a really idea that, that is as clear as day to me. In, in fact, I don't make any notes about ideas I have at all because the ones that stick really stick. And, and that's sort of how you tell. And 
is the word idea, not image? Let me, let me explain. Question. Let me let me elaborate. My my stories come to me. Have come to me over fifty years of playwriting. Out of little two-inch items in newspapers, mm. they have come out of things that I've seen on the street street corner, standing on a street corner. They have come to me by way of stories I've I've been told. Um, never an idea, Jez. Mm. Never an idea. And, and, but that's. I can. Yeah, I really, I really agree. I mean, I've never come up with some, the, for example with Jerusalem the first thing that came to me where I knew that I had to write the play was was as simple as a man in the dark beating a drum on on a stage oh well, there we are yeah uh, okay <coughs> that was something I really wanted to see okay. <laughs> good, good good and you Rebecca I I don't have an idea, you know, I don't have a pocket of ideas, you know, someone says, what are your ideas? I, I don't have them, and, and like Jez, I'll never note one down, because normally it's kind of working itself out over a year or something. I think, oh, there's something about jealousy, or there's something about sisters, and... But then what usually happens is a voice will happen. So I've got one voice that starts to happen in my head, and I start, I, I cycle around London, and I'll be cycling around, and the voice will start in my head. So I'm cycling in funny voices, you know, yeah. and, and then that voice, I think, who is it? You know, but, so sometimes an image, you know, like I remember seeing a woman on the South Bank and she had these huge, huge ankles and she had this gold anklet around her ankle, which was vast, you know, and, <laughs> and I, it just never left me. I thought, why? You know, she's, she's adorned her ankle, you know, and, and, it, and no reason why she shouldn't, but it just never left me, you know? It was kind of... So little things kind of, I think, oh, sometime that will come back to me, you know. Um, Do you put them down in a notebook? I don't, no. No, I don't either. No. I'm an addicted notebook here. Yeah. I should write things down and I just think, oh, I'll remember that. And then I don't. I, you know, it's the same, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and thinking, that's it. I had a dream once. That I could re that I w that I could write like Shakespeare, you know. And in the dream, I was in a skip, a rubbish skip, you know. But I had this gift of writing like Shakespeare. I was like, it's amazing. It's like I can do it. I know how to do it now. That's amazing. All I've got to do is remember. And then I woke up. You know? <laughs> it was great, though. I mean, it was really fun. <laughs> that sounds like a great one for your notebook. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it was Virginia Woolf who was. Advice to a young writer, wasn't it? You know, get it down, mm. Na shoot it, put it down. Absolutely. Because you will forget. Yeah. I think, the, you know, the gestation happens without you even realising. And then things like writing a play, I never sit down and think, OK, what's the structure of the play? What am I going to do? It just sort of grows in a kind of weird mess, you know, that hopefully becomes at some point, you know, 120 pages that then I have to extract 30 mm -hmm, pages mm -hmm, out. Mm -hmm. You know, people ask me about things like structure and, you know, I don't really, I'm just excited if I've got an idea, you know, I'm deeply excited. It's like I've reached land after swimming, you know, and I'm just, I'm so relieved. I'm like, I'm okay, I have a reason to live, you know, <laughs> and I'm so excited that things like, you know, the scene or the characters, you know, I'm just like, that doesn't matter, I've got, I've got somewhere, you know, and then I just yeah. write and that's the joy, but it's a bit like, you know, I mean, you know, the chasing the dragon or something, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you're after that and 90% of my time is, is not like that, you know, actually 90% is generous, 98% of my mm. time is not exciting, you know, 2% yeah. is what I chase after. Yeah. Perhaps before we uh, invite the audience to be the fourth participant, Ethel, could we narrow it down to the train driver because it would be interesting, I think, for this audience to hear a little bit about the genesis and... and well, it started... It was one, once again an item in a newspaper that um, stopped me dead in my tracks. Just stopped me. It was a story about a woman, her name, Pumla Lolwana, three children, living in dire poverty in a squatter camp uh, outside Cape Town. 
who took her three children and uh, went to a railway line, waited until she saw a train coming, and then stepped out onto the rails, and all four of them were killed um, by the train. For me, that woman uh, became a, seemed to sum up, be the story of so many South Africans, so many women who live in these squatter camps. There's one squatter camp in Cape Town outside the city where when it rains, the whole world is flooded. And mothers, because there's nowhere to sit down, have to stand all night, most probably two, three nights in a row until things dry out with their children in, their, in her arms because there's nowhere to sit down, nowhere to put them down. It, the, 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 the circumstances are dire and I, I just felt that the story of Pumla Lolwana somehow brought all of that uh, together for me and I thought to myself, yes, this is an appointment, that is a word my word I use within these things happen to me. That is an appointment I'm going to have to keep. <laughs> and it was, I think, two years after that, when I, actually on my 70th birthday, that I noted in my notebook that today I am going to start living with Pumla Lolwana and her three children. I don't know what's going to come out at the other end, whether it's going to be a play, whether it's going to be a prose work, um, I don't know, but I know that I have got to bear witness. I've got to keep her company. And so I started to live with her every day, every day, logging my progress, my lack of progress, because I couldn't really move forward. And it surprised me, disconcerted me, because... For example, there was another occasion in the past when a little two-inch news item uh, drew my attention and I again had a sense that I have an appointment here. And without too much of a delay and without too much trouble, a play began to form out of it and it ended up as my play, My Children, My Africa, a play that I'm profoundly attached to. But it wouldn't happen with Pumla Lolwana. I tried everything. I tried everything I could. I used my much vaunted imagination to try and penetrate. It's what my character in The Train Driver says as he tries to understand because I finally got to write a play but with a difference. Uh, as he says when he addresses or speaks to the spirit, hopefully the spirit, the ghost, or can hear what he says. He says to her, I don't know what it is like to live without hope, but you did, didn't you? You didn't have any more hope for you or your child. And th that was my experience with Pumla Lulwana. I couldn't understand, I couldn't actually penetrate the darkness which for me enveloped her. And I gave up. I, sub I admitted defeat. In fact, I went to uh, my wife, and my wife's a very serious Buddhist, and we visit a forest monastery in Southern California every Sunday night, or did. It's a bit difficult now because of age. It's quite a drive. And um, I spoke to the abbot about it, and he tried to put things to rest for me, but uh, they didn't work. And so I gave up, I admitted, and I haven't failed very often in terms of appointments that I've recognized I must keep. But this was, I was convinced, was going to be one of them. But then, sometime later, and I wish I had known if I could find the notebook in which I had logged that moment, I'd be able to share it with you, but it suddenly I realized that although I couldn't deal with that woman on the tracks, there was somebody I could deal with. And that was the man in the cab of that diesel locomotive. I mean, after all, he's a South African like me, white, 
like me, loaded with bigotry and prejudice like me, you know, male chauvinist like me, you know, he's all those things. He's, he's a brother. I, I, I can get into him and I can see what, what he's about when he watches that face coming closer and closer on the railway tracks and then it's all over. I can, I can explore that. And I proceeded to Eric and um, that is the play you read, The Train Driver. What I did was also out of reverence and a sense of Pumla Lorwana being a very sacred identity in my life. Because I know, as Rufus Sachi says in the play, the train driver in my play, as he says of the woman, he, did he or didn't he, who killed her, but he's, the woman that his train killed, he says, I know that you are mine in a way that nothing else in my life has ever been mine. And I suppose it's true, you know, if you are somehow involved in killing another human being, uh, even if it is just as a witness or as some sort of peripheral participant, I mean, that's not an experience you're, you're going to walk away from lightly. And um, so Pumla Lawana, I couldn't, I didn't want to use a name. I didn't want to use a story even though I, there was no, no information about her. The only thing I used was the image of a woman with a child. She had three. I decided I would make it one. I moved the story away from Cape Town, where it originally happened, into my region, Port Elizabeth, the Eastern Cape, which I know very well. And there's a railway line, a commuter, little commuter railway line. So all of the possibilities were still there passing squatter camps and what have you. And there are two, and this is where the gods give you things, you see, when you're a writer. There are two train stations on that line, Perseverance and Dispatch. <laughs> and, um, and there it is, the train driver. And that's what's on stage at the... Hampstead Theatre at the moment. Thank you.